tells me that as soon as I don't turn it off, somebody will. <laughs> <will. laughs> That's the way it works. Welcome to Coffee Pot Bible Fellowship in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And we're going to start with one song and then we'll do prayer requests. So we got Jerry and Owen. Thank you. send us your prayer request, text message, Facebook, YouTube, you know, just get them to us and uh, let us know whether or not you want them announced for, or publicly or not. Uh, join me in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this day that you've given us and uh, be with us as we uh, meet here this morning, Lord. We uh, hear what we need to hear. We have the open heart to receive it, Lord. And we pray for drivers for their safety and their being away from their families, Lord. And be with those we have with uh, illnesses and cancer. We've got Linda, Pastor Tommy, Caleb, Jeremy, and Penny all on our list for prayer. And then we pray for our country and our leaders, especially our leaders, and uh, for leaders otherwhere, uh, elsewhere in the in the world, Lord, and especially over in Ukraine and Russia. And uh, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm pressed. 
again. So this morning we are going to talk about the devil at church. And uh, I think uh, if we think back to various passages of the scripture and uh, maybe even some own interests in our own lives, we can agree that some pretty interesting happen, pretty interesting things happen when the devil shows up at church. And uh, believe me, he uh, he does. So if you'll join me this morning, we're going to be in Mark chapter 1. We're going to read from verses 21 through 28. So starting in verse 21. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have, what, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him, and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. So this story occurs in the normal flow of the life pattern of our Lord Jesus Christ. He uh, he'd just given the call of the fishermen to follow me, and now, in what was a very normal pattern for him, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath to teach. And this man, who was possessed by an unclean spirit, he was demon-possessed, was in attendance. And it would seem that this man had lucid periods in his life, or he probably wouldn't have been admitted into the temple. If we make an application today, we understand that those who are controlled by Satan do indeed have lucid moments where they are not recognized. Jesus referred to them as wolves in sheep's clothing. Quite likely, this was not this man's first trip into the synagogue. 
Perhaps he'd been there several times with no incident. Yet when God showed up, he acted out. It took the presence of God to evoke such a response from him. All too often, this is the way it happens. Church, as we call it, goes on with little or no response. Then God shows up, and when he shows up, all bets are off. The very presence of God is enough to cause a reaction from Satan. So let's look at three lessons from this. Number one, we'll look at the attraction to the devil. Here are the religious people getting together ostensibly to worship God. So why in the world would Satan want to have his unclean spirit, or what we would call a demon, at church? What would be the attraction? Why would he even want to be there? Well, let's think about that. Satan, or Lucifer, has always been religious. He's also monotheistic. He knows and believes there is only one God. James tells us this in, in his writings, that while he is opposed to Christianity, he is not opposed to churchianity. He loves to see people gather, especially when they're insincere about their worship. And whenever a crowd shows up, the devil wants to be close by because he loves meetings and loves large groups. Makes it easier for him to find his prey in a large uh, assembly. He's always looking for easy prey to deceive. When you consider this demon-possessed man, and consider the myriad of other reported demon possessions in the Bible, it's easy to see that the devil really wants to control people. He wants to control our thoughts. He wants to control our emotions. And if he can get you before God does, then he can control you. The people who can be controlled are those who are not already under God's control. This could very well be what happened to Judas, Agrippa, and others. Satan, he wants us to think that he knows best, and sadly, many believe his lies. He's seeking to possess the lost and then oppress the saved. If you are an authentic believer, he wants to sift you. This is what Jesus told Peter that the devil wanted to do, and he will not be happy as long as you have any spiritual life left in you. He shows up at church to see who's vulnerable, who's deceivable, and who's controllable. The devil is always seeking worship. Above anything else, he desires your worship. It was evident in Isaiah 14 when he rebelled against God. It was evident in Matthew 4 when he tempted Jesus. And it continues to be evident in the Revelation where he still desires to be worshipped. Candidly, we worship him every time we give him first place in our lives. We worship him any, every time we put anything and any everything above where Jesus Christ and our life toward him should be. He puts temptations in our lives to pull us away from God and toward him. We worship him when we give in to him at that moment and bow down to him, and that is exactly what he wants. And that is his attraction to church meetings. That's why him and his demons attend church. So what does he hope to accomplish? Well, he wants to undo whatever God does. When God shows up, Satan wants to be close at hand to try to explain away all of God's workings. Have you ever considered why we seem to see so little of the miraculous, miraculous deliverances or the glorious changes in our lives? It is because of our unbelief. God says that if we have the faith of a mustard seed, we can do anything. Well, when we've got Satan worming in our, his way into our lives and convincing us that things aren't really the way they are, you, uh, you're not going to have any faith to stand on. But Satan worms his way into our churches, our services, and our hearts, planting that seed of unbelief that a miracle could happen. And then once again, we believe the lie. And our lack of belief limits our Lord. The saddest verse is Matthew 13, 58, which says, And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. God acts to develop our belief, and then the devil does all he can to destroy that belief. And that's exactly why he's here. He wants to place doubt into the minds of people. 
where clear and truthful teaching occurs the devil will try to counter it by placing doubts in the minds of the listeners satan is the great counterfeiter he's that little voice in your head which says well you know that's not all that important or that's not right or maybe even you know the bible says but i believe this and it is in this way the satan has us missing in matthew 6:33 but seek ye first the kingdom of God. Well, you know, let's just stop right there and admit we've already missed that mark. There's three concepts that exist in those three words. Seek first and the kingdom of God. We understand the seeking part as we seek to have everything this earthly life can give us. We also understand this idea of being first. We want our kids to be first in all their activities we want to be first in our prominence and our prestige and of course popularity and for those who like sports we want our teams to be the first we want them to be at the very top to be the best we even have a little understanding of the kingdom of God but here's our problem we've missed putting all three of these concepts together and Satan is the culprit he places the doubt that first actually means first he wants to undermine spiritual authority the concept of spiritual authority is an is an area where the devil can be applauded in the 21st century in especially in the Americanized church where divine authority is perceived the devil will, will attempt to destroy both the speaker and the authority and that's his pride showing through in our text, the evil spirit interrupts, shouts out, and attempts to get the crowd to turn on Jesus. Evil cannot stand for authoritative truth to be told, and generally will react, and sometimes even violently. This is what happened to Jesus, and this is what's happening in churches across America today. While it is true that no pastor is on the same authoritative level as Jesus, it is equally true that our Lord has placed a solemn and huge responsibility on the shoulders of every man called of God to speak and lead for him. And Satan is doing his best to undermine God's man. Chaos in the church is Satan's mission, and he's very good at it. So let's watch how this entire encounter is used by our Lord to bring good and how evil loses. So we've already said this, but... The unclean spirit was comfortable in the church until Jesus shows up and truth is taught because he recognizes Jesus when he realizes who it is and what he's hearing he cannot help himself and he cries out in a loud voice he interrupts the service by saying what have we to do with thee then by name he says Jesus of Nazareth he asks art thou come to destroy us and concludes with a statement of truth befitting a follower and not a fraud I know thee who thou art the Holy One of God even an unclean spirit a demon and messenger of Satan knows the Lord Jesus on sight Luke records that a spirit filled man named Simeon recognized who Jesus was when he was only an infant the disciple John records that John the Baptist recognized Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. Here this demon in the synagogue recognizes and knows who Jesus is. So here's the question. Does the demon know more than you? Is he more familiar with the divinity than you are? When Jesus passes by, are you like Zacchaeus or are you like Nazareth? Make no mistake, even the demons know Jesus. And he responds to Jesus. Jesus told the demon to be quiet and get out. The word for be quiet is actually be muzzled or hold your peace. Or in other words, no more talking. And you know what the demon did? Well, he did what everyone has to do. He obeyed. The only thing he could muster was a cry of agony because the Lord of creation had spoken. Jesus did not give the demon a choice. But for some reason, he does give us a choice. To us, he might say, stop your talking about how you can make it without me, or stop making excuses, 
or even stop standing in the way. When Jesus shows up, he has an agenda. He wants to clean up the place, clean up our heart, or clean up the group to make them into what he wants them to be. He dismisses the evil one and begins working on our hearts. <coughs> Have you responded to Jesus' offer of life, hope, help, and eternity? Have you even heard his call? Or is the evil one clouding your mind and covering your heart? It doesn't take a whole lot for the devil to insert these little tiny lies to make you doubt everything that you're hearing and to make you wonder if, well, you know, that's, that's not quite the way it works. You know, that, that's why we've got so many denominations of churches and so many cults in the world today is because the devil stepped in there and just planted one little seed of doubt and just turned everything the other way. So let Jesus speak the word to send the evil one away. Because when he leaves, Satan, unaware, does one more thing. He reveals Jesus. The unclean spirit not only identified Jesus by name, he not only revealed Jesus by his authority, but the way this entire incident came down, he made Jesus very well known. Verse 28 calls it the fame of Jesus. When we come before God in the right way, and the evil one attempts to destroy things, Jesus can use this interruption to build his kingdom, but he expects us to come before him in the right way. Psalm 51:17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. He expects our honesty, our openness to him, and our love. Week after week, we enter the building and make no mistake, the unclean spirit gathers with us. He nudges us to not participate in the service, to dismiss the prayer time as just a waste of time, and he minimalizes the scriptural message because the preacher is just way too serious about this thing. And when we listen to the evil one, the devil wins the day. Don't miss this. The devil is not concerned for you. He would never give up anything for you, and yet our Lord gave up everything for you. So don't let the devil get the victory in your life. We must recognize, we must respond to, and let Jesus be revealed in us. And don't give credence to the little doubts that pop up when you're reading your scripture or when someone else is reading it to you or during a message because that's just the devil presenting his doubts and getting us to turn away from what we need to be hearing and need to be thinking about. So that's our message for this morning. We'll have one more song by Jerry and Owen before we're dismissed. Yeah.
this morning and uh, for all of those watching online uh, we'd glad to we'd love to see you in here in person and uh, feel free to send us a message at any time and thanks for watching <laughs>